Welcome to the Prophecy Club, where we study and research Bible prophecy. Our topic tonight is the top 13 Illuminati bloodlines. As prophecy students, we have all heard people say, well, they want to bring in a new world order. They want world government. They want world religion. They want the mark of the beast. Well, who is the they? Our speaker tonight is going to answer that question. Who is the they? Not only that, but their plans and how they plan to bring us into this global satanic conspiracy government, economy, and religion. Our speaker has, for the last six years, deprogrammed people from different mind control, top Illuminati people that were wanting to get out of it. He has deprogrammed, de debriefed, I should say, debriefed over uh, 24 different people. He's author of the top 13 bloodlines of the Illuminati, and also this book, The Illuminati Formula Used to Create an Undetectable, Total Controlled, Mind Controlled Slave, and 13 other books. Will you help me welcome Fritz Springmeyer? <laughs> Before I get started with my talk, I <clears throat> have a few words to say. First, it's a great pleasure and a great privilege to be here with you. It's very important that you feel a part of what I've got to say tonight, because what I've got to say tonight is going to affect your life and your children's lives and the lives of future generations if there are any. I'm not trying to frighten anyone, but I do need to tell us about the situation, the dangerous situation that we are in today. Ladies and gentlemen, like you were told, I have co-authored with Cisco Wheeler two books on uh, the New World Order's mind control. And this small version here has a Japanese translation to it. <clears throat> Many of us Christians are not afraid to be thrown into prison because we realize that we are free in Christ no matter where we are and they are the slaves no matter where they are because they're slaves to sin. However, with today's sophisticated mind control technology they have the ability to strip us of our own thoughts. We can no longer depend upon having a situation where our mind and our thoughts are our own. Now, <clears throat> I didn't write this book for myself, but I wrote this book, which uh, it, for sure is volume two. I wrote this book for the church so that they could come to the fullness and measure and stature of Christ and also for humanity. We're rapidly approaching a point in time where everybody who thinks is only going to be thinking what they are programmed. Now, you can uh, stay in denial and turn your back on humanity or you can read this book and then pass this information on to others. I want to get the word out, but I can't do it all by myself. I need your help. Getting this volume two book won't just help me, won't just help Prophecy Club, but will help humanity in general. And even the children can help. They can pray for those of us that are trying to get the message out. Now, I also need to warn you, <coughs> that this talk is not going to be politically correct. <laughs> but as a Christian in a nation where it's politically correct for 330 congressmen to write 20,000 bad checks over a period of three years, and as a Christian in a nation where it's politically correct for groups like Planned Parenthood to sue a high school in Florida, which is trying to teach abstinence insects 
to its unmarried high schoolers. While on the other side of the nation, in LA, you have a school district which is beginning to think that there might be some relationship between their free condom program and their sex education class and the high rate of teenage pregnancy. So they do the politically correct thing. They offer a class in creative masturbation. As a Christian in a nation like this, I enjoy being politically correct just a notch below AIDS. Je uh, Admiral Stanfield Turner, in August of 1977, before a Senate committee, uh, revealed to this committee that, yes, the CIA was doing mind control on countless numbers of Americans who were, uh, and this was being done without their consent, and he even told some of the methods that they use, hypnosis, electroshock, drugs. This is a newspaper article from the time period, and here you see listed one of their programmers. Hey, Smack, what are your four answers? Yes, sir, no, sir, no excuse, sir. Sir, I do not understand. I entered West Point on July 3rd, 1973, and uh, was the first two months there are called Beast Barracks. That's where they tear you down and they build you into the soldier that they want you to be. Now, I knew there was something wrong about West Point, but it's taken me years to really get the full picture. But between my first and my second year, I went over to the Holy Lands, and it was right after the Yom Kippur War. And they had just won a tremendous victory, but they had won nothing. And for me, as a Christian, it really showed how ludicrous it was, how insane it was for us to fight these wars for the politicians. And it especially drove home the point that there are lots of men that will fight for the system, but there are only a few men that are willing to fight with that dedication in the Lord's army. So I took the lesson that I had learned at West Point, and that one lesson was obedience, and I decided to apply that to my Christian life. When somebody asked me to do something, when they gave me an order at West Point, I didn't ask, am I going to do this? But I, I simply responded, how am I going to do this? And so in my second year, I resigned from West Point with only one goal in my life. That was to serve Christ without reservation. Whatever your will is, Lord, I want to obey you like I have been taught to obey the army. And so it didn't matter what the Lord was going to tell me, how silly or how ridiculous it might be, I was going to do that. Amen. So when we start looking for the Lord, where do we go? <clears throat> well, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was a symbol, and the symbol was with God, and the symbol was God. Symbols are very important. We use them to organize, to design, to communicate, to observe our world. Symbols are what elevate us above animals. And I think that in Satan's bag of tricks, just the manipulation of symbols alone is a tool that's capable of controlling mankind. This is a very interesting use of symbols. A friend of mine who worked for the New World Order, very high up in the New World Order, and he was one of their mind-controlled slaves. He had been part of the Illuminati. And one day, his photographic memory wrote down this formula. He said that the Tetragrammaton, which is the symbol that stands for God, <coughs> equaled a formula for DNA. And I'm not saying it does or doesn't. I thought this was a very interesting use of symbols. My friend was to visit me on January 12th. 
On January 11th, he was murdered. So when we begin to look for God, where do we start? Well, if we decide that there's no God, we have placed ourselves in the position known as atheism or the same position that some Buddhists have placed themselves in. But if we decide that there are gods or a God, then we have another choice to make. Are there many gods or one God? If we decide that there are many gods, then th we have decided uh, to take the position known as polytheism, which is the same as Mormonism, the New Age movement, Greek and Roman mythology, Hinduism. But if we decide that there is one God, then we come down here and we can decide whether he is identified with the universe or whether he is distinct from the universe. If we say that he is identified with the universe, we have taken the position known as pantheism and panentheism, which is uh, Zen Buddhism and Christian science. But if we say that he is distinct from the universe, <coughs> then we have a choice. Is he finite or infinite? <coughs> if he is finite, then we have placed ourselves in the position that the Watchtower Society of the Jehovah's Witnesses took. There is a little known doctrine that they promulgated the first half of their history, and most Jehovah's Witnesses are not aware of it, but the leadership that they have today, which is old, was around when they promulgated this doctrine, and they haven't repudiated it, so we have to assume that they still hold to it. And that doctrine was that God was a finite being, like you or I, and he lived in the star constellation, the Pleiades. You've heard of Pleiadians. And he, this was specifically on the star Alcyon, and he sent messages to the governing body of the Watchtower Society from Alcyon, and it took eight days. But if we say that God is infinite, then we come down here and ma can make the choice <coughs> that he never does miracles, or he sometimes does miracles. If he never does miracles, that's what's known as deism. The rational thinkers of the 1700s thought that way, like Thomas Jefferson. However, a lot of those men were closet occultists. But then we can also decide that he sometimes does miracles, and this is places us into this uh, category known as theism, which is uh, typified by the faith of Abraham and many of the types of your mainstream monotheistic religions. So, how do we know what's truth? If we go back to the beginning, we will find out that there were two sources of truth. There was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and there was the tree of life in the garden. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil includes worldly knowledge of what is right and wrong. It's the letter of the law of God. And the dead religion based on compliance to the dead letter of the law. It's man-made compliance to law and man-made changes in outward behavior. It's a focus on self. If we focus on ourself, we can go two directions. We can indulge and become licentious or we can go the other route, which is a problem in some churches. We can become self-righteous. It also includes a false trust that worldly philosophy and other fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will expose Satan. It will not expose Satan. Why? Because Satan appears as an angel of light. Remember how much we have placed in the basket as it was passed around? Satan was willing to give Christ the entire world on the mountaintop. How's that for a donation? The fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will not expose Satan. This is what is called in Scripture the flesh. It leads to death, not to mention also producing in the mind lasciviousness, double-mindedness, and pride in what one knows. It's the goodness of man, and it's very popular. But the other tree in the garden, it included a fear of God, peace, 
God-centered knowledge, which is relevant to what God is doing, therefore wisdom. It's the spirit of the law, a living faith and a relationship with Yahweh God. Its spirit made changes in the heart. It focuses on Christ, the spirit, and the heavenly father. It exposes Satan and his influences by correctly using the living word of God written by the spirit along with the guidance of the spirit. It's what the scriptures call the spirit. It leads to life, not to mention a renewed sound mind and humility to learn from others and from the master teacher. It's the goodness of God. And it's very unpopular because a natural man doesn't receive the things of God because they're foolishness to him. But there was a problem. Satan came into the garden and brought evil. And this has produced a logic problem. For here we have a God who's omniscient, all-knowing, and a God that's omnipotent, almighty, and yet he's, we're told that he's holy good, and yet something that this holy good, all-knowing, uh, all-powerful God, something that he has created, has evil in it. Now this problem has faced all of us on a subconscious or a conscious level. In fact, it was such a problem with philosophers in the 1940s that a number of them began, it, began writing books and ph uh, philosophical systems. They were writing books to expose Christianity and other religions as being illogical, especially because of this logic problem. One of these men uh, lived in Boston, and uh, he worked for decades writing a book exposing the illogic of uh, Christianity because of this logic problem. In the early 1960s, he realized that his philosophical system had the same logic problem. In fact, even though he didn't become a Christian, he realized that the Bible had a lot to tell us. And so he spent the next decade writing a book explaining how much Christianity did have to offer. But a lot of us, we go to our clergymen and we ask them about this problem of evil and we're given insufficient answers. We're told, just have faith. Or we're told, there's no contradiction. Or it, the answer is so smooth, but by the time they're finished, all these terms are devoid of their usual meanings and are vague. Or perhaps it's declared to us that we only see through a glass darkly. These insufficient answers leave many reasonable persons deeply disturbed by the absurdity of conventional belief in God. Some have decided that human life is self-defeating, tragic, and absurd. There's better answers. But you may be wondering, why is Fritz focusing on this? When time is so short in this talk, and we all know that there's a problem with evil, and we all deal with this logic problem. Well, the reason why is because the good Lord called me to do three things. First, expose evil, then give hope, and then call people back to the word of God. If you have a prophetic ministry, it's very easy, if you don't expose evil, to give flippin' hope. Oh, just vote the characters out of office, see? But on the other side, it's very easy to expose evil and then walk away without giving people hope. But if you're doing like I'm trying to do, to expose evil to the very depths of evil, it's very hard to give people hope. So this is very important to our discussion today. There are better answers. For instance, to show that every mathematical, scientific, and philosophical system has vagueness and contradictions within their principles. Philosophers cannot define and defend their own criteria of meaning without employing self-defeating arguments. All philosophy and mathematical systems have paradoxes when one pushes to get total clarity of terms. One has to either accept A, 
some vagueness of terms, or B, accept paradox with extremely clear terms. Next, common sense of human existence means we must accept the contradictions that accompany the complexity of the sense and nonsense of our spiritual environment. Life is full of nonsense. If you try to write a computer program to decide whether somebody loved you, and they squeeze your toothpaste from the middle of the tube, and the computer program kicks it out that they don't love you. Life is full of a lot of nonsense. It can't be broken down into logic. The problem of evil is actually a sign that reveals that there are deep issues of life that must be plumbed, like a crack in the Earth's crust that plunges out of sight. Now, people, evil is not out of control. God has said, I will establish a point in time here that I'll allow evil to begin, and evil can continue until this point in time. And then he showed us that in between these two points, all evil can be turned to good, and the proof of that is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God can view evil in a different view, because he is above time and knows that with his unlimited power, all things will work for good to them that love God. God has unlimited power to bring something good out of evil. Proof of this ability is the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. In order to bring true love into human existence, God had to allow choice, which includes the choice of rejection and disobedience by his creation. After a period of allowing mankind to choose to love him, God promises to destroy evil. But there was another thing that sin brought. We're talking about trauma. As I started to work with these people under Illuminati mind control, this mind control is often called trauma-based mind control. I realized that what was being done on a very intense scale was actually being done on a looser scale to all of us. We're traumatized. And we're traumatized for a reason, to program us a lie. It's very important we catch on to this. First, a trauma is applied. Second, a lie is offered, which when accepted alleviates or improves the pain of the trauma. And third, systems of lies are built to trap us within the confines of the lies we believe in. For instance, imagine we're uh, thousands of years ago in India, and uh, be, uh, we are traumatized, and because this is demonic-based, the lie has told us, if you worship this phallus, this lingam, why, your pain will be alleviated. And we do. And because the, this is all demonic-based, why we have some alleviation of the pain. And then our culture is, makes this a tradition, and we are all trapped into the lie. Now here's another example. A Christian's life is cut short by Satan. The lie that is offered the survivors is God owes every person a full, happy, prosperous, 70 to 80 year life. God is then blamed. Why did God let this happen? The resulting bitterness opens up a door for a person to get into immorality, which further entraps the person. The reality is, if God gave us what we deserved, in our weak, sinful nature, none of us would be alive because mankind is in rebellion to God, their creator. People need to focus on what they have received from God, not what we haven't received. To focus on what wasn't given rather than the great gifts that have been given is ungratefulness. Therefore, when a trauma is applied to our life, we can use that trauma to program a lie into our life or we can grow spiritually by seeing the deeper spiritual realities that the trauma is trying to teach us. And again, recapping all of this, Christ's life is proof that God has the ability to turn evil into good. And God has told us that he will use suffering to take our eyes off of trivial things so that we can see deeper et uh, eternal realities. It, uh, he also tells us that uh, suffering will develop our faith, virtue, knowledge, 
self-control, endurance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. As we are taught in 1 Peter, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. And we are also receiving suffering to prove that we're a royal priesthood. And here is Apostle Paul, and he's talking to the philosophers of his day at the Areopolis, and he's going idols, idols everywhere, even an idol to an unknown God. And here he is again with the Acropolis in the background, talking to the philosophers of his day. I've come to tell you about an unknown God, and if you want to read what Paul talk, told the philosophers of the ancient world, read in Acts 17. Now we talked about the Spirit of God leading us into all truth, the tree of life. And the Spirit revealed this to me, and then he confirmed that by giving the same revelation to other brothers, who uh, then I subsequently met. This is how paradise runs, or how it's sustained. We're looking at the real before we look at the counterfeit. It's very interesting. The Spirit revealed that God's attributes themselves are what sustain paradise. And if we look at how we define God or what God is, we find that those are the elements that make up the New Jerusalem. Now the basic structure of paradise is a cube. And this has some inherent uh, attributes to it. For instance, it's stable. On the bottom, uh, we find true love. Now, I might interject here. I'm not teaching this as a new doctrine. I'm just presenting it to you so that to help you picture or understand how things work. On the top is God's order, authority and authority covering. And then we find on the rest of the cube, justice, truth, equity, and life. And there are books that could be written about this revelation, but we are just briefly covering it. <clears throat> In contrast with this, this is the world system that Satan has set up. And it's a double pyramid structure. This was again given to me by revelation of God, and again it was confirmed by other brothers who received similar revelation. But what was very interesting was confirmation from an unexpected source. That was Norman Dodd. Norman Dodd was the chief investigator of the Reese Committee in 1953. Congress established the Reese Committee to investigate the un-American activities of the foundations. Norman Dodd had lived and worked around the movers and shakers of the world his entire life. He was a banker, amongst other things. And these movers and shakers, many of them Illuminati, they thought that Norman Dodd was one of them. So they freely talked to him. But at one point, after having rubbed shoulders with them for years, he realized how they were running the world. And he put together this model, and he showed it to Alexander Sox, one of the most powerful men at that time in the nation. And Alexander Sox said, I can't stay here in the room and listen to you explain this if you want to be alive. That's how right on it was. There are six elements to this world system. Order, represented by the state, wisdom, values, justice, the courts, truth, the church, wealth, the prices, and equity, the market. And I've added to what Norman Dodd had as just wealth, I've added health on there as a function of that. This is a double pyramid. It has some intrinsic things to it, too. The base supports the top. And uh, you have a mirror image on the bottom. You will also find that uh, the cube shape is talked about in scripture as being the structure of paradise. It's the shape that the New Jerusalem is in. It's the shape that the Holy of Holies is in. And we are also told in Matthew that we are the salt of the earth and a salt crystal is the shape of a cube. Likewise, there's some scriptures that talk about this shape. Uh, being a, a satanic shape. And 
Interestingly, too, there are some scriptures that use the word stoichia in them, approximately six of these, and Bible scholars have been scratching their heads wondering, what does stoichia mean? If we go back to the classical Greek, we will see that they use the word to mean elements that make up something, that comprise something. I believe that when the scriptures warn us not to be deceived by the elements of the world, that they're referring to these elements, even though they're not spelled out. And originally when I had put together this talk, I was going to go in and show how each of these different elements of the world system was controlled by the Illuminati. But this, is, this talk doesn't have that much time. So we are only going to briefly talk about some of these things. But I want you to be aware that there is information that will show how each of these elements are controlled. Now this next diagram is extremely important to our discussion today. And it will, be, it will tie in with a lot of things that we say as we go through our discussion. This is the way Satan creates a Gnostic religion. There are three components to a Gnostic religion. I discovered this reading in an obscure Gnostic book in an obscure paragraph. And all of a sudden I realized they've just told me how they do it. Remember back in the Garden of Eden, they, Satan said, this knowledge will save you. That's saving, saving knowledge. That's Gnosticism. Okay? So then the next step was, is they realized knowledge is power. And they realized that if you say, I have hidden knowledge, people have to come to you for that hidden knowledge. You create an instant power base. So the first, first element that Satan uses in setting up a Gnostic religion is hidden knowledge. <clears throat> now the next thing is you can't give away all your hidden knowledge at once or you've just given away your power base. So you have to dish it out in increments. If you're a Mason, you receive it incrementally as you go through an initiate degree system. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, you receive it incrementally by staying in touch with, and this is a direct quote, God's channel of communication. You incrementally receive Watchtower and Awake magazines. Or if you're in some Pentecostal churches that make you dependent upon this prophet who has revelation knowledge that no one else can give you, then uh, that's another example of how this hidden knowledge makes you dependent upon a religious system. Now the next criteria, the next uh, thing that they use in setting up a Gnostic religion is that you can't get the devotion from the common masses that you can from an initiate group. So you set up two different religions. You set up one for the broad masses and one for the initiates. And then you establish a cover ruling body and then at the top the key men are Satanists. So let's uh, take the Jehovah's Witnesses, for example. There we've got the great crowd who are promised life on earth. And then we've got the anointed, promised heaven, and then their governing body, and then their key men. In 1991, I came out with a reference book, Be Wise as Serpents, which was 800 pages, sort of like a Young's Concordance of the New World Order. And I tried to go through many different groups and show how they had been created and how they were being manipulated and controlled. And, for instance, with the Jehovah's Witnesses, here up at the top, we've got a man named Nathir Salee. He was an Iraqi Jew, who, and he loves nice, expensive jewelry. And the president of the Watchtower Society, the late one, Freddie Franz, recently died, for many years, for many decades, had been on his deathbed. And he was considered to be the leader of the Watchtower Society. Nobody even knew about Nathir Salee, but whenever there needed to be a decision by this man on his deathbed, who died at 99, Nathir Salee would go into his room and come out with the answer. Now another man that was, um, uh, ties in with this 
is um, someone who's on the governing body who's a Rhodes Scholar. In fact, Freddie Franz was offered to be a Rhodes Scholar, but turned it down so that he would be in a position to take over the Watchtower Society. Now, if we take this structure with its three components that I've just outlined to you, and we turn it on its side, this pyramid structure on its side, we come up with something that looks like a pie. Now, think about this. Here on the outside, we've got like a Catholic and a Mormon and a Jehovah's Witness. This is the perfect control mechanism. The Catholic out here is fighting the Mormon, is fighting the Jehovah's Witness, is fighting somebody else. None of them ever rebel against the sinner. Very few of them ever realize they're being controlled by the sinner. If they ever do rebel against the sinner, they are stopped by the initiate group, the clergy. For instance, in the Catholic Church, your broad masses would be your laity, and your initiate group would be your clergy, and then your cardinals would be your covering, cover ruling body, and then your key men would be Satanists. Or within your Mormons, you would have your Melchizedek priesthood, and your, or your Aaronic priesthood, your Melchizedek priesthood, and then your 70 and whatnot at LDS headquarters, and then your key men there. So, uh, some of these of the priesthood that are, are being a buffer to protect the, the sinner, some of them are actually going to believe in the religion, and some of them are just going to be in it because that's how they make a living. But at any rate, it's the perfect protection for the sinner. And these people in the sinner all know each other. They are your Illuminati. And Satan knows when you go to a restaurant, you like a variety. So all of these groups are patterned on that, that pie-shaped thing that I just gave you, that pyramid. And my apologies to Baskin Robbins, there's more than 31 flavors there. <laughs> And this is just showing you, I want, I want to briefly mention one other thing about this uh, diagram here. These boundaries between the different pieces of pie are artificial boundaries. Satan can pull those out anytime he wants, and we see glimpses of that every now and then, like at the World Con Parliament of Religion, where Hindus and Buddhists and Indian shamans and Satanists and Chuck Colson representing the Protestants, got together and prayed. And as a little bit of a tidbit of, that, of what I'm saying, this is a Jewish father who's bringing Mary worship to the Jews. But the pyramid structure is too easy for people to see, so they've taken the deception to another height. They've created what's called the spin principle, segmented polycentric integrated network. This is dim uh, and here the spin principle is demonstrated by New Age teaching institutions. What you do is, is you set up many little what look like grassroots organizations. They're all spinning the same direction. And then if somebody tries to take one down, all they get is one little node and the network remains. And here's another example of the spin principle. This is by New Age groups. And this next transparency no longer applies since about 1950 because they are merging all the religions together. But originally the Illuminati worked behind front. Satan's empires like an onion with layer after layer. And you have to peel it back. So the Illuminati uh, created and worked behind groups, mystical groups, which then in turn controlled and worked behind monotheistic groups. So Freemasonry behind Protestantism, Jesuits behind Roman Catholics, Frankists behind the Jews, Sufis behind the, uh, Islam. Now we're going to go through these next transparencies very quick, very quickly. Uh, they are part of a document packet I put together in 1990 and had for a while but and, um, after offering them for a couple years, I think I got like one person who requested one. They're showing from their primary documents what they are trying to do. And here in this document, Manley Palmer Hall tells us that a secret governing body controls the globe, not the various religious governing bodies that pretend to rule. 
That's what I was trying to tell you with that diagram with the black uh, circle in the middle of the pie. And who is Manly P. Hall? Manly P. Hall was a grandmaster in the Illuminati, and he was also a grandmaster in Freemasonry. And here is the Scottish Rite Journal, journal's obituary of him, illustrious Manly Palmer Hall, often called Masonry's greatest philosopher. Now, this is from Alice Bailey. She wrote The Externalization of the Hierarchy, and she was head <coughs> of Lucius Trust. <coughs> and Lucius Trust, as so many of you already know, is a publishing company. Uh, uh, Lucius Publishing is a publishing company for the United Nations. And uh, <coughs> it was originally known as Lucifer Publishing and Lucifer Trust. And Alice Bailey created 140 New Age religions, and she worked for the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare in 1957, establishing educational goals that are now being implemented in the United States. For instance, Global 2000. And she, and she writes that Freemasonry will be the reli uh, universal religion. Other uh, New Age leaders, like Benjamin Krim, also say the same thing that Freemasonry will be the a new universal religion. And she says that between the church and esoteric groups and Freemasonry, there is no disassociation between all of these. <coughs> this is just simply to show you that uh, the next quotes are coming uh, to you on the basis of the highest Masonic authority. This is. Um, Ancient Mystic Oriental Masonry written by Clymer, a high-ranking Freemason. <clears throat> and he tells us that Masonry is connected to the ancient systems of priesthood. And he lists the different ancient systems of priesthood of the mystery religions. <clears throat> and he tells us that the Celts and the Brahmins and others, Ahura Mazda in Persia and and even the uh, Pharisees, your Levites, Curitus, Magi, Brahmins, Druids, they were connected by secret ties and intercommunicated from the Indus to the Tiber, from the Nile to the Thames, hence there ever has been, is, and ever will be Freemasonry on our planet. What he's talking about is that inner black circle I was talking to you about in the ancient world, there were many mystery religions, and each of those mystery religions had their councils. But men from those councils got together in a supra council, council <clears throat> and that controlled it all, and that was the Illuminati. Now, a lot of you have never probably heard, heard much about that term before, so let's talk a minute about what the Illuminati is, what the word means. The mystery religions only went underground for a long period of time. But they all, the priesthood always continued. You can't find any point in history where they were ex extinguished. And in 1776, they reorganized themselves as the Illuminati. <clears throat> the Illuminati is the continuation of the mystery religion. As an example of that, when I met the Illuminati Grand Master and now he's an Ipsimus in the Illuminati, in our Northwest area, shook his hand. He had a ring on his finger. And if you go to Manley P. Hall's book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, on page C, which is 100, you'll find that he says that a silver ring with a snake swallowing its tail it indicates rank in the mystery religions. And this Grand Master had a ring exactly like that. <clears throat> and here is uh, from Clymer's book again, and it says, So broad is the religion of masonry, and so carefully all sectarian tenets excluded from the system, that the Christian, the Jew, and the Mohammedan, and all their numberless sects and divisions may and do harmoniously combine in its moral and intellectual work with the Buddhist, the Farsi, the Confucian, and the worshiper of deity under every form. That's also a direct quote from Mackey's Masonic Jurisprudence. So you have two 
Masonic authorities that are telling you the same thing, that Freemasonry is a universal religion. And here is Clymer again, and he says, Masonry was founded on the ancient wisdom religion, and when founded, was not known as Freemasonry. And here is something from Morals and Dogma. When you become a 32nd degree Freemason, they give you Morals and Dogma to read and, and to carry around. And, <clears throat> and if you uh, read in there, you will find that Albert Pike, who was the head of all Freemasonry in his day and known as the Pope of Freemasonry, says, Masonry is identical with the ancient mysteries. And this is from the Masonic House of the Temple in Washington, D.C., the Scottish Rites House of the Temple. And there's another room in this building, which is a 14 by 25 room with 13 chairs, where the Grand Druid Council of the Illuminati meets. And here's from another Freemason, high ranking, Foster Bailey. And he says, little as it may be realized, by the unthinking mason who is interested only in the outer aspects of the craftwork, the whole fabric of masonry may be regarded as an externalization of that inner spiritual group whose members down the ages have been custodians of the plan and as those to whom has been committed the working out of the will of God for the race of men. They assist at the unfolding of the consciousness of the candidate until the time comes when he can enter into light and in his turn become a light bearer, one of the Illuminati who can assist the Lodge on high in bringing humanity to light. So he's telling us here that if you are uh, selected as a Freemason, you may be able to go on and be one of the Illuminati. Here are a few of our presidents who were Freemasons in their Masonic garb. George Washington, Andrew Johnson, and you see William McKinley there, and William Taft and Theodore Roosevelt, and FDR, and Truman, and Ronald Reagan. And here's Alice Bailey again in her externalization of the hierarchy. And she tells us that in place of Christi Christianity, the mystery of religions will be restored by the church and Freemasonry. And Manly P. Hall tells us, the genuine esoteric associations always required that disciples prepare themselves for careers of practical service. The student was expected to attain a state of unusual skill or proficiency in some branch of learning. He was then to practice this profession or craft as a, mat, as a means of extending his fear of constructive influence. He was to teach through example, enriching his chosen vocation with the overtones of enlightened religious philosophy thus gradually creating a significant zone of influence. He was available for whatever task the keepers of the great plan required. So if you're a member of a group like Freemasonry, they want you to work towards this goal of one world government and the new age the, that they call the great plan. And Alice Bailey tells us how they're going to do this. She says, by means of the educational work of the world, the great Lord, who she refers to in this book as Lucifer, seeks to reach those of the intelligent public who cannot be reached by means of ceremonial and symbolism as in masonry or by religious means and rituals as in the church. It touches the masses and those in whom the intelligent aspects predominate. What she's telling us here is, and we'll read it again in this next one, is the three main channels through which the preparation for the new age is going on might be regarded as the church, the Masonic fraternity, and the educational field. We're going to get them in the churches to, uh, to bring in this new age. But not everybody goes to church. So we'll teach them in the fraternities. But not everybody goes to a Masonic Lodge. So then the safety net for it all is education. We're in a period is of what is called externalization of the hierarchy. They're taking what was done in secret a uh, hundred years ago and they're externalizing of what was done by the hierarchy in secret into society. So that's why when I go down the street and I get a meal at a fast food place, here is a wizard doing magic with Lilith, the owl, and throwing energy balls on my hamburger sack. And then I go down the street and 
here's an identical looking wizard and fire and ice, which are important symbols in the occult. And then I go to the next fast food place, and this is their placemat, and it blows me away. How to hypnotize your parents. And then I go on to the library, and they're handing this out as you go through the door, Metaphysics for Our Age. And I look inside the library book, and they have the symbol for the Illuminati, a snake swallowing its tail, and it says Illumino. And then I find out that it's Freemasons running our libraries and our school system. And I go to the laundromat, and here's a lady who's channeling demons, and she's going to teach how to use your spiritual energy, and she's teaching this in the Portland Masonic Temple. And I come home and I think, well, it's safe to read the food section in the paper at least. <laughs> and here's a witch teaching witchcraft in the food section. Now, I told you that they're going to use education to bring in the externalization of the hierarchy. My wife has taught in a public school, and this public school for the last 15 years has had nothing to do with Christmas. They have an occult ritual uh, winter solstice program during that time period. And in 1991, this was the program that they gave the parents who came to a meeting like this to watch their children put on the play. And they celebrated the return of Lucifer. And inside, this is the program. And the children on stage, some of them had acceptable barcodes on their foreheads, and some of them had unacceptable barcodes on their foreheads. And by the way, I happened to send this uh, um, one day to Tex Mars, and he put it on the front of his newsletter. Now, getting back to Alice Bailey, she says, the Masonic movement will meet the need of those who can and should well power as the custodian of the law, as the home of the mysteries, and the seat of initiation. It holds in its symbolism the ritual of deity and the way of salvation is pictorially preserved in its work. The methods of deity are demonstrated in its temples, and under the all-seeing eye, the work can go forward. It is a far more occult organization than can be realized, and is intended to be the training school for the coming advanced occultists. In its ceremonials lies hid the welding of the forces connected with the growth and life of the kingdoms of nature and the unfoldment of the divine aspects of man. If you're an Illuminati uh, boy, the Illuminati wants you to go through Freemasonry to learn the outer symbols of the mystery religions. But the real hardcore rituals of the mystery religions are reserved for Illuminati rituals or some of the higher rites of Freemasonry. This is a cover of one of the Scottish Rites magazines the Supreme Council 33rd Degree, their official magazine, has been known as the New Age Magazine for 100 years. They've been promoting the New Age movement for a long time. In the 70s and 80s, Christians were still debating whether there was a New Age movement. And in the inside of this magazine is a page which has a very interesting quote. As stated before, God's plan in America is a non-sectarian plan. Our Constitution is non-sectarian. Our great American public schools, God's chosen schools, are non-sectarian. The great spirit behind the great nation is non-sectarian. Our great American public schools have never taken away from any child the freedom of will, freedom of spirit, or freedom of mind. That is the divine reason that great God, our King, has chosen the great American public schools to pave the way for the new race, the new religion, and the new civilization that is taking place in America. Any mother or father or guardian who is responsible for the taking away of freedom of mind, freedom of will, or freedom of spirit is the lowest criminal on this earth because they take away from that child the God-given right to become part of God's great plan in America for the dawn of the new age of the world. They're saying, shame on you, Christian parents, for sending your kids to Christian school. You are the lowest criminal on earth. And here is Lucius Trust, um, just a letter from them indicating that their triangles groups are in 110 countries. <clears throat> this is from another Masonic magazine. It says, Masonry's greatness is not in the antiquity 
of its beginnings, neither in its conservatism, but rather in the fact that it has always been a leader of thought and action. I repeat, a comprehensive understanding of the history of Masonry leads inevitably to the conclusion that not through conservatism has it most served the world, but rather through its spirit of unrest, its utter abhorrence of unnecessary restraint, its abiding love for liberty, its unconquerable desire to progress away from the old to the new and better conditions. Wherever the conflict has been waged between the old and the new, between a narrow conservatism and real progress, our Masonic brethren have been found on the right side. Witness the members of St. Andrew's Lodge of the Green Dragon who threw the tea into Boston Harbor. I wish I had a dollar for every time that I have been, I, I have heard someone talk about the Boston Tea Party being a tax revolt against high taxes. What actually happened? British Parliament drastically slashed taxes. So why would people revolt against that? Well, the people didn't. But the Masons at that time period were smuggling uh, opium into this country in the bottom of ships. They are also smuggling in tea. And when British Parliament drastically cut import taxes, it made their, their illegal tea uncompetitive with the legal tea. And they were upset that this was going to cut into their profits. So when they were going to have their lodge meeting that night at the Green Dragon Inn, and you might remember that name for later on it might come up, they decided, and if you look in the minutes of their lodge meeting, you'll see that they decided to cancel their meeting that night, and they, they planned to dress up in, as Indians, and then they went down to Boston Harbor, and there was this poor captain who was at the wrong place at the wrong time, and they dumped millions of dollars of his, however much it was, of his tea right into Boston Harbor. It was a criminal act, and now history has been tweaked a little bit, and we see them as great patriots. <coughs> <clears throat> this was from a map that I did and just showing Masonic lodges during the revolutionary time period. The Freemasons were the ones who planned and carried out a large share of the American Revolution <clears throat> and uh, 33 of the 35 signers of the Declaration were Freemasons. There are over 800 <coughs> fraternal organizations in this nation. Essentially all of them have start, been started by the Freemasons. Many religious groups and religions have been started by the Freemasons. <coughs> and if we look at this Scottish Rite Journal page, we see that they say Freemasonry has a world power. And they see this in 1921 when this was written. Um, that there was a struggle between Freemasonry and the Catholic Church. This was one of those many controlled struggles that the uh, Illuminati has given us. Well, it's no longer that situation anymore. In 1993, in one of my newsletters, I uh, listed hundreds of top Vatican officials and their initiation dates and their secret Masonic member no membership numbers. This is just a small section of the list. And here's the Catholic Church with the Illuminati all-seeing eye in it. <clears throat> now there are a number of top 13 families. You've got Astor, Bundy, Collins, DuPont, Freeman, Kennedy, Lee, Onassis, now Reynolds is not one of the top 13, but it's close up there. Rockefeller, Rothschild, Russell, and then you've got your 13th Illuminati bloodline, which is the Merovingian bloodline, which believes that they are descendants of Christ and descendants of Lucifer in the house of David. And uh, you've got the Van Dyne family. So these are your top Illuminati families. Now, we're going to take a break from getting an overview of things, and we're going to focus in on just one little time point in history, the Civil War, and we're going to look at three men at that time period. This is so that we can see how the small relates to the big. 
we're going to look at Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses Grant, and John Brown. John Brown was an abolitionist who um, tried to arm the slaves and by doing so provoked the South to want to have an armed rebellion. Abraham Lincoln ran on an anti-slavery platform and his election provoked the South to secede and Ulysses S. Grant was Lincoln's best general and the greatest Civil War a hero. <coughs> now, the Illuminati wanted to create an American Civil War. The United States was getting too big and too rich, so they wanted to divide and conquer. And they wanted to bring us into debt and create a national bank. And they were also looking forward to all the war profits that they were going to get running drugs and munitions and other things but they needed people to implement their plan. And we're only going to look at three people, and of those we can only give, due to time, a fraction of what could be said. So let's look at the first person. Let's, uh, let's look at John Brown. <coughs> John Brown was a Rosicrucian and a Mason, and so was his father. Now, there was a Rosicrucian named William Lloyd Garrison, and he created the Anti-Slavery Society in 1832. He also um, became a member of the Order of the Rose in England in 1834. There was another Rosicrucian, uh, George Lippard, who was a member of the Brethren of Light, and it was he who taught John Brown to be rabidly anti-slavery. Now, John Brown didn't know much about the scriptures, but he was traveling through a Mormon settlement, which ties into all of this, but we can't go into it, and they taught him their blood atonement doctrine, where you pay for the sin with your own blood, and so he thought in his warped mind that if somebody sinned or he did something he didn't like, that gave them, him the right to blow them away with a shotgun for the wages of sin is death. John Brown was a murderer, and so was his sons. But he was a common man. He only became what he became because he had a conspiracy behind him. Now, there was a club, the Berg Club, that met in Young's Hotel in Boston, Massachusetts. And one of the members of the Berg Club, Senator Charles Sumner, went over to Europe and visited with leading Illuminati kingpins. And for instance, Giuseppe Mazzini. And he came back then and, <clears throat> and got the Berg Club organized into a group to a conspiracy to arm John Brown. Uh, several of the members of the Berg Club were Unitarian pastors who appeared as pacifists while they were sending supplies and guns to John Brown. For instance, we had Unitarian Reverend Higginson and Unitarian Reverend Parker. And then there was Unitarian George Stearns who manufactured lead pipe. If you know how poisonous water is when it's put through lead pipe. And then there was Garrett Smith who was an Illuminati multimillionaire whose father was best associate with John Jacob Astor the first, another Illuminati kingpin. And then they not only set up this secret group to help John Brown, but they, uh, they pulled their establishment media in line, and so groups like, papers like the New York Times, who had Karl Marx as their correspondent, uh, built John Brown up into a hero. And they sent over a professional revolutionist, a Jewish Freemason named Amschel Bondi, who uh, helped John Brown in places like Bleeding Kansas. And when he was done, then went over into other places in the world to help with other Masonic-inspired uh, revolutions. Now let's look at Ulysses Grant. Ulysses S. Grant was born and named Hiram Grant. He was named after the Masonic sun god Hiram Abiff, and his father was a master mason and a leader of a lodge. His father's name was Jesse Root Grant, where we heard the Root name. Remember Eliah Root and Colonel House? Jesse Root Grant 
worked for John Brown's father. And when he quit working for John Brown's father, he started working for E.A. Collins. Well, who are the Collins family? The Collins family is one of the top 13 Illuminati bloodlines. Remember the Pilgrims? The Pilgrims are one of the Puritan groups that came over to New England. When the Puritans came over, there are groups of witches that came over with them. Francis Collins, who came over with one of the early groups of Puritans, was a witch. These witches came over. Now remember, in New England, the state supported the churches. They taxed the people and then gave money to the churches. So it was advantageous to be an establishment state-sponsored church. So the churches that the witches set up and belonged to, they called themselves the same names as the Puritan churches, which was Congregational and Presbyterian. But after the Civil War, around 1824, the state quit giving these churches money, and so it, be, it no longer was advantageous to continue the name, and so the witches uh, created the Unitarian Church. Well, one of the Collins started the Unitarian Church, which in turn started Yale and Harvard. And there were Illuminati secret societies at Yale before they brought in the Order of the Skull and Bones. Now an example of a, a Unitarian minister who is also Illuminati is Karl Follen. He created their Bund der Jugend in Europe, and he, uh, which was Illuminati front which also operated behind another Illuminati front, the Swiss Bible Society. But when things got too hot, he came over to Harvard and taught as a Unitarian minister. There was another um, man that was active, uh, noteworthy to note, James Anderson Collins. He was also busy working with Unitarians, Rosicrucians, Masons, and Socialists to create a civil war. Now, the Collins family in the 1700s branched into the Todd family, 